How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God And all will see How great, how great is our God Sing that again How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. The splendor of King clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one. He is Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our
Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we, again, we welcome you, and you are joining us at the last uh, section on a, a series we've been doing. Uh, at the beginning of each year, generally, we revisit uh, these verses, because these verses are basically our mission statement as a church. What we believe you know, God has called us to do, and who to be, and how to accomplish what he, he's called us to uh, we've already spent two weeks working through this passage of Scripture, and this morning will be our, our last time here before we return to our study in 1 Thessalonians next week. Um, so let's go ahead and stand, and we'll read the Word of God together, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump in. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Colossae, and ultimately the Holy Spirit speaking to you and I this morning says, uh, we preach Jesus, or him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Already we have enjoyed uh, Lord, just your presence and the work of your spirit in our time of worship. And Lord, as we gather around your word now, we pray that you would find us humble, teachable. Lord, that uh, in spite of our familiarity with this passage, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear uh, new things. Lord, that you would uh, help us to apply the, the truths of your word into our current state of of being, uh, Lord, as individuals and collectively as a, as a church body. Father, we thank you that your word is alive. It's powerful. It's capable of renewing our mind and restoring our soul and conforming us into the image of your son, Christ Jesus, as we submit to that work of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that nobody here this morning would just be uh, here as a just kind of a religious duty, but Lord, that we have come in faith, expecting not only to hear from you, but to respond to all that you want to speak into our lives. And so, Father, here we are. Have your way. Lord, spend us upon your purposes and be glorified in our time together. We trust you for this, and we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, have a seat. Uh, this morning, we're focusing on the last section of verses 28 and 29. The Apostle Paul uh, saying, you know, to this end, you know, uh, to the end that Jesus is being proclaimed, to the end that we're presenting, you know, everyone complete in Christ. He says, to this end, I, I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. That's where we're, we're spending our, our morning, focusing. You know, we've talked about what we're called to do as believers. We're, we're, we've spent time discussing, you know, how that looks in relationship to one another, uh, in the context of discipleship, and, and now we're going to look at how we, we accomplish what God has called us to do, ultimately. Last week, I made a, a football reference, and I, I want to just revisit that for a second, just to bring some clarity. I had, I had picked up on a quote somewhere that I thought was really applicable for the church, and that quote was this. And, it, and of course, this was speaking about football game. And what's that? European football. I've been here long enough where I don't use soccer anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Real football. <laughs> um, the quote goes like this. It says, you know, football is a game where you have 20 people on the field in desperate need of rest and 20,000 people in the stands needing desperate need of exercise. Yes. And, and all too often... That is the, the reality in a church setting where you've got a handful of people who are 
you know, running around like chickens with their heads cut off, you know, working their fingers to the bone and, and everyone else, too often, you know, it is just kind of in, there to enjoy the ride. And I wanted to make sure that nobody misunderstood what I was saying last week. I was not saying that that is the case here. Amen? That is not the case here. We have an incredible team of people. There's a huge percentage of our fellowship here who are actively involved in ministry. And the beautiful thing is I actually, even this morning, talking to somebody, just saying, you know, we want to serve. We want to get involved. And we, I, I mean, I've got half a dozen or more people I can think of right now on the top of my head that are waiting for the opportunity to start serving in this church. And, you know, and it's going to happen all in good time. So all of that to simply say that I just wanted to clear the air just in case anybody was confused by what I was trying to get across this morning. We have an incredible, generous, faithful, serving congregation here. Uh, and that's really applicable. One of the reasons why I'm bringing it up again this morning is because of what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about how we get the work done. How do we get the, the responsibility you know, that God has placed upon the church to proclaim the name of Jesus, to disciple believers, and to build one another up in the faith? How do we get that work done? And it's very easy to lose sight of where our source of strength comes from. Amen? And, and so that's where we're spending this morning. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I labor towards this end, proclaiming the name of Jesus, discipling believers. Remember, Paul lived in the first century. He lived in a world that was entirely unchristian. He's looking at the great commission that Jesus had given the church to go and make disciples of all the nations. And he, he's thinking, I don't have a single moment to lose. I don't have a single day of my life you know, to waste in light of what God has called us to do. And he makes this Pauline you know, uh, version of Jesus' great commission when he says, you know, we are called to proclaim Jesus warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that, may we, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Last week we talked about what that means, you know, to be complete in Christ. Uh, so I, I won't go over it this morning. But he said all of this, you know, this is what I'm laboring for. This is what I'm working towards. And he says, I'm striving according to God's working which works in me mightily. Now, the Apostle Paul, I think, you know, if we were to meet him, I, I don't suspect that any of us would be tempted to call Paul lazy. <laughs> this guy, you know, single-handedly uh, changed the world that he, he lived in. Not single-handedly. He, he wouldn't take that, actually. He wouldn't accept that, that, that definition. He was, he was very much aware and conscious of the people around him that were a part of his ministry. But from where you and I stand today, looking back at his life, you know, it's easy to come to that conclusion. Uh, and, and so again, Paul, the last thing I think Paul would have been accused of was being lazy or indifferent or, or, or apathetic. And one of the reasons why this is important to us this morning is because, you know, we understand, hopefully, if you're here this morning... Hopefully you understand. If you don't understand, this is great news. Listen to this. We are saved by grace. We are, the Bible says that salvation is the gift of God that Jesus paid for with his own blood and his own body. And like any real gift, the only way to receive it is to reach out and take it. And this morning, if you haven't already received that gift, the Bible says if you have the faith to reach out and take that gift, God has already paid for it. it it's done. There is nothing you and I can do to add to what Jesus has done in securing the gift of salvation. This morning, if you haven't already, the only thing that you can do in response to what Jesus has done on the cross is to reach out and take it to it. First of all, recognize that you need it. 
to understand that you're a sinner like the rest of us who's standing on our own before a holy God is done. And the only way that we can hope to stand before him is to receive the the gift that he has given us that has made us righteous, that has made us holy, and and to receive it as, as a gift. Now, because we are saved freely as a gift, there is a temptation to think that the entirety of the Christian life is one of just uh, freedom. You know, uh, or let me rephrase that, one of, of where, where we don't have to do anything. Because we haven't done anything to receive the gift of salvation, uh, we may be tempted to think that because you know, uh, we haven't done anything to be saved, that I don't have to do anything to, sh- to, to reciprocate to the Lord what he has done for us. You know, because I haven't done anything to be saved, I don't have to do anything in response to being saved. Does that make sense? We don't work for salvation, and sometimes we're tempted to think that we don't have to work for anything as believers. I'm, I'm good with God. I'm accepted in Christ Jesus. I'm washed in the blood. You know, salvation is mine, and I might as well just kind of kick my feet up on my spiritual hammock and wait for Jesus to come back. Well, Paul dispels that rumor in, in, this, in this statement. He says, we proclaim Jesus. We, we, you know, we, we are called to um, present everyone complete in Christ, not only positionally, but practically. Encouraging, challenging one another to mature in our faith, to grow in our relationship with God, to figure out you know, how God has gifted us to serve within the body of Christ and to continue changing the world that you and I live in today. And Paul says, this is the purpose for which I labor, striving according to his Power which works mightily in me. Now, the first word that we're looking at this morning in the Greek is the word labor. And that word labor means to, it's not just a general term for work, it means to feel fatigued, to work hard, to toil, to work to the point of being wearied. And again, the next word we have here, striving is the word uh, agonizome, where in the English we get the word agony. And in the original Greek, it literally means uh, to contend with an adversary. It's actually a picture of two people wrestling with each other. And again, thus we get our word agony, agonizome. And so Paul here is using very strong terms to communicate how he is... Uh, working towards the achievement of these goals that God has given the church. He says, I labor. I work hard. I I weary myself in in the process of accomplishing these things. I'm striving, agonizome, to literally to compete for a prize, to fight, to labor, to fervently strive. The NIV reads it this way. Paul, uh, sorry, the New International Version reads it this way. To this end, I strenuously contend. Again, these aren't just colorful words that the Apostle Paul has, you know, picked randomly to try and get his message across. This was reality for him. If you go back to the book of Acts, and you read about the life of Paul, you, re- you, you see how this was a reality for him. In 2 Corinthians, Paul gives us just a little taste of what it, it meant for him to, to strive or to, uh, to uh, contend for the faith. In, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, listen to Paul recite just a little bit of his resume in terms of the challenges he faced in the process of getting the gospel out into the world and making disciples. He says, from the Jews 
This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. He says, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day in the night I have been in the deep. In journeys, often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren. You know, and you know, the list would no doubt go on if Paul had been given the time. And for you and I, we read stuff like this and we're, we're tempted to think, wow, Paul, man, you know, relax, bro. <laughs> you know, maybe you're taking things a little too far. You got to know your limitations, man. That, that's a temptation. Reading something as radical and, and extreme as this. And you and I might wish that that was the case, that Paul just didn't know when enough was enough. But the reality is, it is... Paul just raised the bar to such a level that all of us are, are, are challenged by his example. We wish it wasn't such a high bar. It would make things a lot easier for you and I, wouldn't it? But the bottom line, and I think one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to you and I this morning, is that the world will, be not, will not be changed by our sentiments. The world will be changed by our actions. Sentiment is good. Sentiment can be a, a powerful motivation. But our sentiment alone is not going to change the world. It's not going to equip us, empower you and I to do what God has called us to do, to proclaim the name of Christ in our marriages, in our families, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, we are God's fellow workers. Fellow workers. Yes, we're sons. Yes, we're daughters. Hallelujah. We're saved by grace. It's a free gift. You know, we've been given the right to be called the sons and daughters of God by, by faith in Christ alone. But we are also God's fellow workers, it says here in Corinthians. And, you know, we can talk about and pray about a great harvest here in Paphos or Cyprus or wherever you may call home. We can talk about these things and pray about them all day long, but until we put our hands to the plow, literally, physically, tangibly, until we put our backs to the work, until our faith translates into the way we use our hands, the way we use our mouths, the way we move our feet, then we're, we're, we're missing the, the mark of what God has called us to. You know, we're, we're called to feed the poor. We're called to clothe the naked. We're called to defend the weak, to bind up the brokenhearted. These are very practical. These are very tangible, very, you know, real life, real time uh, expressions of God's love and our, our faith in the world. And those kind of things can never happen without God's people working and, and, and working together. It is a cooperative effort between the body of Christ and its head, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, there's a beautiful story in the Old Testament in, in uh, the book of Haggai when the, uh, the, the Jews had returned from captivity to Jerusalem and God had commanded them to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the city after having it, it, after it had been destroyed because of God's judgments and, and their, uh, his disciplinary actions against them for their disobedience. Uh, Haggai was a prophet that God raised up to encourage the Jews in the rebuilding of that temple. And Haggai prophesied to the, the Jews of that 
generation as they were, as they were struggling to find motivation to, to get the job done. And in Haggai 2.4, God speaking to his people through the prophet Haggai says, Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. Why? Because I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. He said, listen, guys, you know, it's work. You know, you can sugarcoat it all you want, but at the end of the day, it's hard work. But I'm with you. Therefore, put your hands to the work, and sure enough, you know, the, the, the job got done, got done. And that's the case for us th- this morning. You know, the work is hard. Being faithful to Christ in this world today comes at a cost. And if you've tried doing it, you know how challenging it is to, to stand for, for Jesus in this dark and troubled world that we live in. And so we're not fooling ourselves into thinking that it's you know, easy, that it's light lifting. On the contrary, we understand that it's hard work to build the kingdom of God. We are called to proclaim Christ Jesus. We are called to preach him. We are called to present every man complete in Christ. That is, again, striving individually and collectively to encourage each other to grow in our faith and our relationship with the Lord. We are called to respond to God's, this, this free love that God has offered us, we are called to respond to it. I was sharing with Clinta last week before her baptism, or a few days prior to her baptism, that while, that while salvation comes to us freely, serving Christ, walking with him into the fullness of our calling could potentially cost you everything you have depending on what that calling is. And so last week, you know, we we spent time talking about what that means, complete in Christ. Colossians 2.9, we looked at where it says, in Christ you have been made complete, and how positionally in him, you know, we... uh, us in Christ, we are fit for heaven, and Christ in us fits us for earth and for service here and now. We talked about discipleship, that, that process by which uh, God is working out our positional holiness in a practical way, right? Moral purity. Do we understand that, church, this morning, that we are called to be a, a people that are morally set apart from the world? We're called to grow and mature in our faith, and we are help, called to help to prepare and to equip ourselves and one another for service. And again, just, to, just for a variety, in the New King James, we read this morning Paul saying, to this end I labor. The New American Standard reads this way, for this purpose I work. And then the New Living Translation says, that's why I work, continues to be the heartbeat of ministry, to help us all move from the the mystery of godliness into the reality of godliness in our lives. Christ in us, we read last week, the hope of glory. So this morning, we're we're spending our time focusing on, on the how. How do we fulfill this calling upon our lives? How do we do it in a way where we don't burn out, where we don't get frustrated, where we don't throw up our hands and say, man, it's just too much. The world is too unresponsive. You know, the the demands, the cost is too much. Well, Paul puts it to us this morning in very simple terms. The Holy Spirit speaking to us says that we labor, striving, contending, what? According to his power. The Greek word there for power, energia. We all know 
what that means. This is crucial for longevity in the Christian life. I don't believe the Christian life is a sprint. It can be. Sometimes it feels like we're sprinting. (laughs) But the reality is that the Christian life is a marathon. And we're in it till the end. We're in it till hopefully, God willing, we take our last breath. That's, that's the kind of the idea. And if we aren't drawing our strength from God, then it is only a matter of time before we run aground, before we start discovering the limitation of our own abilities, our own strength, our own resources. God has given us his spirit. And compared to yours and my strength, his is like an inexhaustible sea that you can never draw enough from. And the problem is is that we lose sight of that. It's, It's a temptation for every single person in this room. Anybody who's been walking with Jesus for any length of time You know, the temptation is that we lose sight of the fact that what we've been called to do, we've been called to do in his power, in his strength, through his spirit, and not in our own abilities. And that's good news, because if it it was depending upon me to finish the race, I hate to tell you this, guys, but if you don't know already, I would have failed long ago. The only reason I'm still in this after 25 plus years is because of God's grace and because of God's spirit. Ephesians 1.19 says it this way. God has given us the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the workings of his mighty power. It's like Paul can't find enough words, you know, to express how much we need his power to to, to live out the Christian life, just the normal Christian life. He's just grabbing all, all these terms, exceeding, greatness, power, might. The NIV reads first uh, Colossians 1.29 this way. It says, you know, I'm striving with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in us. Uh, I don't know if there's many more terms you can find, you know, to, to, to get this message across to us. Powerful, mighty is the, that Greek word uh, dunamis or dynam, uh, proper pronunciation? Dynamis, dynamis, where we get our English word dynamite. It means force, miraculous power and ability, strength. It can, it's translated sometimes as violence. It's the same word that the Bible uses to describe the followers of Christ when the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost and transformed them from frightened, divided, group of disillusioned followers into lions of faith, every one of which died proclaiming Christ Jesus as Lord, except for the Apostle John. That power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for. Luke 24, 49, after Jesus had risen from the dead, You would think that his appearance, having defeated death, would have been enough to inspire the disciples to go out and win the world. But Jesus said, no, wait in Jerusalem. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts 1.8 is the fulfillment of that command we read there. Uh, Luke records as the apostles, as the followers, forgive me, of Jesus gathered in Jerusalem, 120, waiting for this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says in Acts 1.8, you, sh- oh, sorry, forgive me, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
Jesus reiterating this, uh, this, this command to wait for power. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Jesus wasn't prepared to let his disciples start the work of changing the world until they were empowered by his spirit to do so. Jesus was able to say prior to the cross as he was preparing the disciples for his departure, he makes this staggering statement that his disciples didn't understand at the time. He said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. And, you know, the disciples who had left everything to follow Jesus are saying, going away? What are you talking about? Where are you going? You know, how does this fit into you setting up a kingdom of which we will be a big part of? (laughs) Where does that fit in? And Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because if I do not go away, the helper, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will Send him to you. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, listen, after I die on the cross, after I make atonement for the sins of the world, I will ascend to heaven. I will sit at my Father's right hand in my heavenly throne, and I will pour out the gift of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And then you will have everything you need to do what I've called you to do. And so the same one who transformed the the trembling, fearful disciples into these triumphant apostles who literally changed the world, he's doing the same for you and I today. The same for you and I today. Jesus is, interestingly enough, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God become flesh, of whom the Bible says that, uh, John says in John 3, 34, it says that God gave Jesus the spirit without limit. In his humanity, Jesus lived out his entire sinless life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet, in spite of that spiritual dynamic in him, we read that when Jesus was prepared to step into his public ministry, Luke 3.22 says this, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and in you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, And it goes on to say, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan in power and began his public ministry. So Jesus sets the example, in spite of the fact that he had, there was no lack of the Holy Spirit in his life as the Son of God, but he lived out his humanity in the fullness of the Holy Spirit's power. But when it was time for him to step into his public ministry, there is this unique expression of the Holy Spirit resting upon him that all of those there were witness to. And it's important to, well, the same goes for you and I this morning. Jesus was inaugurated into his public ministry Luke 4 says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus read this quotation from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, if Jesus lived out his human life in the power of the Holy Spirit, if the apostles waited in Jerusalem until they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon their lives, how much more do you and I need it, need him still today? Trying to live out our Christian faith in the flesh is futile. 
It's frustrating. It's defeating. And the beautiful thing is, is that we don't have to do it that way. We don't have to live our faith out that way. Listen, our flesh, the old nature, the old Tim, loves to live within my limitations. I love to live within my comfort zone. I sleep in on my day off just like anybody else. (laughs) I have to fight uh, procrastination and all of these other things just like everyone else does. I'm tempted by the flesh just like everyone else is. Uh, We all... If we, you know, our, our flesh is always challenging us. Uh, the, Satan, our adversary, is always tempting us to live within our boundaries. Oh, I can't do that. It's just not me. Oh, wait a minute, but I forgot it's not me anymore. It's Jesus. <laughs> it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in Christ and the Son of God who died and gave himself who loved me and gave himself for me. God forbid that we should live out our faith in our own natural strength and energy. When you look to the scriptures, literally every aspect of the Christian life is given and sustained by the person of the Holy Spirit living within us. First of all, again, if you're here this morning, just for clarity, The Bible says that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, something happens that will not happen in any other religious system in the world. When you are washed clean of your sins through the sanctifying work of Christ on the cross by faith in him, the Bible says that God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. He comes, he moves in and starts cleaning house from the inside out. He starts changing us. That's how he can take an ex-drug addict, ex-convict like myself and make me into a new person. The same way he's done for you, regardless of what your background looks like. When you put your faith in Christ, he gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and he doesn't come in empty-handed. He comes in with gifts. He comes in with strength and power beyond our own. And he he equips us and he fits us to to have a place in the bigger body of Christ. So that not only individually, but collectively together, we can change the world as he has called us to. The Holy Spirit comes in and he brings us Gifts. Romans 12 tells us there are gifts of exhortation, gifts of giving, gifts of leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, teaching. 1 Corinthians says there's gifts of administration, gifts of discernment, gifts of faith, gifts of healings, plural, helps, knowledge, miracles, tongues, interpretation, wisdom. The Holy Spirit Uh, dispenses callings and offices within the church, apostle, evangelist, prophet, pastor, teacher, and more. Listen, if those are topics of interest to you, I encourage you to get a hold of Pastor Lauren's uh, classes on these things. They're available online through the Mathetis School of Discipleship. You can get into the nuts and bolts of each of these gifts and offices. And so identifying our individual gifts is so critical to the equipping of the church to carry out its commission. It's an important part of discipleship. We can't be complete in Christ if we don't know what the Holy Spirit has uh, equipped us with and gifted us with. 
And it, just so you know, it's sometimes a long road be someone I, be, between someone identifying their gift and experiencing it in their life in, in a fruitful way. I was a very young Christian at a Bible study with five or six people, and we were reading and studying through the Psalm 1. And the guy who was leading the, the, the Bible study Said, Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who does not, oh uh, boy, here we go, walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by a river, and this Bible study teacher, and in a word of prophecy, said, this is for you. You're going to be that tree planted by the the." The, the, the streams of living water, the word of God, and you're going to bear fruit, and people are going to... He basically was prophesying that I would have a teaching ministry someday. And at that point in my life, you can, I guarantee you, I was just like, you don't, you don't know me very well. <laughs> if, you, if he had known what a mess I was at that particular time, I was saved. But there was still so much work to do. But... That gift had already been given. This guy identified it. And it would be, you know, 10 years later before that fruit would break ground. And I would actually start to see that manifest in my life. So you're here this morning and maybe you're thinking, well, I don't know what my gift is, this out or the other. You know, study, search the scriptures, pray, ask God to show you. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to, you know manifest in your life right this moment. But if you pursue it in faith, amazing things, God will do amazing things. So, on one hand, the Holy Spirit comes in and he gives gifts and he gives callings in a, upon our life. And those are individual from one person to the next. None of us have the same gifts. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit dispenses, the Bible says, according to his will. Not according to my will, not according to your will. According to the Holy Spirit's will, he gives gifts to believers. But one thing that is universal among us, while gifts are individual, the one thing that is universal among us is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that if you're a born-again, spirit-filled believer, then the fruit of the Holy Spirit will come out of your life. And what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Again, not our love, not my love, not your love, his love channeled through our lives, and I use that word hesitantly. I don't want to stumble anybody by using that term. <laughs> the Holy Spirit causes the love of God to flow through our lives. He says it this way in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So while gifts and callings are individual, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the love of God is not. It is, it is the acid test of our faith. If you want to be preoccupied, because, you know, we, 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 you start studying about the Holy Spirit and, and gifts and this, that, and the other, and, and it's so, for some reason, it's such a temptation for us to become preoccupied with things. And if you want to be preoccupied with anything relating to the Holy Spirit, let it be the love of God. You want to be preoccupied with the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, well, be preoccupied about the love of Christ in us because that is universal. That is, you know, minimal Christian living. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, that our lives are marked by love. Comparing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, with the individual gifts of the Holy Spirit, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. He says, 
earnestly desire the best gifts. It's great that you want to have gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, the scriptures don't uh, discourage us from pursuing them, crying out to God, Lord, you know, I would love to have this gift. He doesn't discourage us from doing that. But he says, listen, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he, he launches off into 1 Corinthians 13, where it says this, if I speak with tongues, have the gift of prophecy, if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith, if I bestow all my goods to the poor, if I give my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it says I'm nothing. It profits me nothing. And so you want to know what the healthy Spirit-filled Christian life looks like it is a, a life that is marked by a, a supernatural love for others. When the Apostle Paul was challenging the church about what a good, solid church looks like, he uses these incredibly simple terms. Writing to the Galatians, who were a church that had been caught up in legalism, and they were being tempted to go back into Judaism and into the law and all of this other stuff. And, and Paul says, listen, you want to know what a, a healthy believer looks like? You want to know what a healthy church looks like? He says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is our faith expressing itself through love. And that will include the operation of gifts and everything else. I'm not trying to, you know, devaluate those in any way, shape, or form, but we need to have perspective and balance, right? Jesus said this to his disciples shortly before his death. He said, by this the Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. We've already talked about what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is, love, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. From Jesus' own lips, he said, as far as I'm concerned, I know you belong to me. The world will know you belong to me by the love that is being evidenced in your lives. Jesus said, by this the world will know you're my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. And we cannot have that kind of love without the Holy Spirit. It's not something we conjure up in our own strength. And so, you know, looking at all of this together, there is only one inevitable conclusion that you and I can reach. Clearly, we can never live out the Christian life without the Holy Spirit's empowering. We are to strive, we are to contend, we are to labor. It's okay to have great spiritual ambitions to proclaim Christ, to make disciples, to change the world. God's given us those ambitions to pursue, to present everyone complete in Christ, but we are fooling ourselves if we think we can accomplish it without him. And it's subtle. The shift away from dependency upon him is so subtle. I catch myself all the time realizing, you know what? I, you know, why do I feel so anxious? Why do I feel so stressed? And I suddenly realize, man, I'm doing this in the flesh. Anybody who's been here long enough can probably identify when I'm operating in the flesh. Those who know me well enough, they're like, oh, Tim, come on, man. <laughs> I should get some rest. I should get some time away with the Lord. Now, before we finish up this morning, there's one thing I, I think we need to make sure we don't lose sight of this particular truth. 
you know, we, we started off talking about, you know, Paul, we would never accuse Paul of being lazy. And, and very easily, as Christians, we can become caught up in this, this work mentality that, you know, can drive us into the ground. You know, we're tempted to look at Paul and, and to see him as just this kind of superhuman, you know, ministry machine. And we might feel, you know, the same about Jesus and, you know, reading the Gospels. That, you know, we, we're, easy, we, 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 we're tempted to think that being filled with the Holy Spirit means that we're just moving from one incredible act of faith to the next. And, you know, we've got this the sheen of spiritual perspiration on my brow all the time, you know. Racing frantically from one act of ministry to the next. But the Bible doesn't paint this picture when it comes to the life of Jesus or the life of Paul. Yes, they were driven. But they weren't driven by the flesh. They were driven by the Spirit. They were burdened, but not burned out. They were empowered, but not exhausted. They were fervent, but not frantic. And I see it in myself, and maybe you're here this morning, and you need to be encouraged that the life, the spirit-filled life, isn't necessarily, you know, this, one long, ongoing, you know, life of drama and excitement and, you know, whoa, wow. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because to, all too often in the church today, that is being sold yes. from the pulpit. Imagine, you know, and, and I catch myself doing it, the, the temptation is to think, you know, your life needs to have an exclamation mark after it. Everything you do needs to be awesome <laughs> and glorious and full of majesty. Yep. This is being sold in many pulpits around the world today. A writer who recently wrote a book called Ordinary talks about the church's addiction to hype. Addiction to hype. And he says this, he says, if you add an exclamation point behind everything, eventually nothing will stand out. There is an exhortation in the scriptures that we forget all too often, and it's this from 1 Thessalonians 4.11. It says, aspire to live a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That, that's like that's not very good sermon material, Pastor. What does that mean? Live a quiet life. We we've we've become so caught up in the drama and the hype and the sensationalization of uh, of ministry that we forget that that it, that's not so much the punctuation marks in our life that matter, but the consistent. Long term faithfulness to, to running and finishing the race. I know uh, a brother speaking to recently who was in a ministry in his earlier years that was just super numbers oriented, super results driven. And it led to his, the divorce of his wife, the breaking up of his family. He, he, he left the ministry. 
He burned out completely. He couldn't keep up with the demands. And I don't know the ministry he was involved with, but by his own admission, the, the expectation level was just so high that his marriage couldn't survive it. He couldn't survive it. And now, after a long season of living a backslidden life, he's only just come back to the Lord and is trying to figure out how to put the pieces back together. And it's not easy. It made a mess. When I look back over the course of my life, there are one or two moments that I would call, you know, fire from heaven moments, you know, where, where the Lord just, his presence was so tangible, you know, that I could just feel him and, and, and where he spoke so clearly to me that it changed the entire trajectory of my life. Two times I can point to in 30 years. The rest was just the, the steady, faithful burn of God's spirit in my heart. And I'm not saying that, that my path is the same as your path necessarily. But again, this idea, you know, when did living a quiet life you know, just being faithful, just being filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit and letting people watch you and see the difference in your life. When did that stop becoming acceptable standard in the church and ministry? We're almost finished. First Kings 19, beautiful story of the prophet Elijah. He had just had this incredible, talk about fire falling from heaven. The story of the prophet of Elijah. He went to challenge the, the nation of Israel by calling them out for committing idolatry. They had uh, begun to worship the god Baal. And so Elijah the prophet, he goes and he has this basically contest of faith. He gathers 400 prophets of Baal. He says, you call upon your god, I will call upon my god. And the god who answers by fire, that will you know, that would be the test of who the true God is. Well, you can imagine how the story goes. The prophets of Baal, you know, they dance around, the hype and, you know, all this ang angst and everything else. And, you know, nothing happens. And then Elijah calls upon the name of the Lord. Fire falls from heaven, consumes the offering. And all of Israel repents and turns back to God. Beautiful story. Very next breath, you find Elijah hiding away in a cave. Fearful of Jezebel, the, queen, the king's wife. After this great spiritual you know, victory, he's trembling in a cave all by himself, and the Lord calls him out. We, at 1 Kings 19, 11, it says, Then God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Listen, we all love the fire from heaven moments. We love the, the dramatic encounters with God. But let's not make that the goal. God often deals with us quietly, faithfully, day by day. It's often in the quiet, still small voice that he speaks more so than the earthquake and the, the wind and, and, and the, the drama and I share that with you, not to lower your expectations, but so that you have the freedom this morning to know that when we're called to win the world, that God has provided his spirit to empower us to get the job done. He hasn't called us to do anything. He hasn't equipped us to do. And... That longevity 
is a beautiful expression of the Spirit-filled life. And you shouldn't be let anyone question that in your life. Ah, oh, you don't speak in tongues. Ah, oh, you haven't experienced healing. Ah, oh, you know, you haven't been to this conference or that movement or this revival or, you know, you're not submitted or part of that ministry. Don't let anybody load you down with unrealistic expectations. Believe God for the, the best. Believe him for everything that he has for you, but understand that it comes from him and not from ourselves. And if we can do that, we will finish our race well. And we will hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Let's stand and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for your words. Lord, as we stand before you as a congregation this morning, and, and, and for those who are visiting us this morning, you know, Lord, what home looks like, what their home church dynamic is. Lord, we thank you that whether home is here or abroad, Lord, all, all of this applies to each of us. And Lord, we thank you for giving us such a privilege to be a part of what you're doing in the world today. Lord, to proclaim the name of Jesus, the only name under heaven by which men might be saved. Lord, it is a privilege that comes oftentimes with a great price. And Lord, we, we don't want to become weary on the way. And so, Father, I ask in Jesus' name at this morning, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we stand upon your promise. Jesus, you yourself said, if, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Lord, you're not the one holding out. It always boils down to our lives being filled with other things or our lack of faith or courage or our lack of willingness to die to ourselves. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you would fill us afresh. We believe you for that this morning, Lord. Fill us this morning and make us a people whose lives are marked by faithfulness and love people who aren't moved by every wind and wave of doctrine or circumstance, Lord, but setting us apart, Lord. For some of us this morning, Lord, that means repenting. We've been operating in the flesh. Maybe we're playing with sin. Lord, your spirit cannot fill a place that is already fill, full. And so, Lord, give us the courage and the faith to turn from our sins or to empty ourselves of everything that would hinder the flow of your spirit in our lives, Lord. Lord, we know it's by grace we've been saved and it's, no, but it's by grace we will finish the race. In the meantime, Lord, we confess that apart from you, we can't do anything. We need you, Lord. Forgive us for trying to do ministry in our own strength, for trying to live out the Christian life in our own strength. Lord, bring us back to that place of utter and total dependency upon you and change us, Lord. Conform us into the image of your Son, Christ Jesus. We trust you for these things, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. By grace alone, somehow I stand, where even angels fear 
Invited by redeeming love.